Hey, here's the solution video for 2003. Oops, 2003. Oh, that's a little bit bigger line than we want. Let's try this one. Yeah, that's nice. Um, 2003, number three. Uh, catapult. Um, so, kind of trebuchet-ish thing. Um, you can read about it here. Here's some important details. Uh, there's 10 kilograms here. That's what we're launching. That's a pretty big thing to launch. It's like bowling ball-ish. Uh, and um, then we're going to put a bunch of mass in here. And you can see the amount of mass that they're putting in. That's a lot. Um, this is a, that's about 2,000 pounds. So um, I don't know where they're getting all this mass, what kind of physics class this is. But um, anyway, more fun than ours, I guess. Um, the, there's also a mechanism, there's something that stops it. Uh, something very, very strong, I hope, seeing as they've got 2,000 pounds swinging around in their bucket. Um, but uh, anyway, it stops in a horizontal position and then this thing gets launched horizontally. Um, all right, so. See if we can answer some of these questions about this situation. Um, the data are plotted on the X below. Sketch a best curve, uh, best fit curve for these data points. So um, something like that. And uh, it's most definitely not a straight line. If you continue all the way down, you're like, well, this should go through the origin. That's fine. You could do that. It doesn't. It's not necessary. And um, you can look at the scoring guide. I think there's a couple points, one for just having a curve that goes through the points and maybe it's just one point for that. And um, maybe the other point that I'm thinking of was the point for this. So what's the distance X traveled if you put 250? Let's see, that'd be 300. So 250 would be here. So that'd be read that out of the graph. I don't know, 32, 33, something like that. About 32 meters. I think that pen is a little bit too thick. Here, let's try this one. Uh, 32 meters. Um, something like that. Great. Now, here's the real work. I think that's only two points out of the 15 so far, by the way. So, uh, students assume that the mass of the rotating arm, the cup, and the counterweight bucket can be neglected. In other words, the only things that we're really thinking about have mass are the big mass in the counterweight and the 10 kilograms up here that's going to get launched. Those are the only things. Um, so um, here in part B, at how many seconds after leaving the cup will the projectile strike the ground? Well... It's being launched horizontally, so uh, in the vertical direction, since it's a horizontal launch, that means the initial vertical velocity is zero. In other words, we might as well be dropping this thing. If, all we, if we're just interested in the time, then we just need to uh, set that initial vertical velocity to zero and find the time that way. So acceleration is um, minus 9.8 meters per second squared. And uh, what else do we know? The delta Y is gonna be, uh, let's see, how far is it gonna fall? It's got this 12 meters plus this three meters, so 15 meters total. And uh, interested in finding the time. So delta Y is equal to 1 half A T squared plus V I T. So uh, let's see what we get there when we find the square root of 15 divided by 4.9. About 1.75 seconds. And um, finally, later on, we are going to 
multiply, figure out, uh, since we have the time here, and I think this is part C, complete the theoretical model by writing the relationship for X as a function of the mass. So there's my time there. And uh, they're telling us here, of course, we know in the horizontal direction, uh, we've got the delta X, we've got the VX, and we've got the T. So now I've got the T. So if I could find this also, which is going to be the um, what we're up to in parts two and three. I'll try to find that. So anyway, that's this is not part of this uh, B part one. So B part two, derive the equation that describes the gravitational potential energy of the system relative to the ground when in position in uh, figure one. So before the launch. All right, so before the launch, uh, the total gravitational potential energy is the mass of the projectile, which is 10 times G times, uh, I think they are, everything has a height of three, right? Before the launch, it's three meters here. So that and that are both at three. So, plus, 10 times the mass, uh, sorry, just kidding, mg also times 3. Um, so uh, that's fine. That's good. Maybe I'll simplify that a little bit. I don't know. You could factor the g out. I think might maybe for the next part might be a little bit better to have it like that. All right. Um, now derive the equation for the velocity of the projectile. So uh, they're really trying to hold our hands here and lead us through this problem. So um, energy has already been suggested to us. Um, and you could do it using um, rotational stuff if you want to. Um, but maybe it's easier to do just translational kinetic, regular old one half mv squared kinetic energy because we're ignoring the arm. Um, if you weren't ignoring the arm, then you'd have to do rotational stuff because you got a big rotating object. But you can treat um, both of these uh, objects that are moving, like this is going to be moving that way and the counterweight is going to be moving this way, right? So um, while we're here, let's just take a look at this. So this is two meters and this is 12 meters. So you know that um, the whole arm is going to have some angular velocity and that angular velocity is equal to V over R, or in other words, that V is equal to omega times R. So however you figure that, whatever the velocity of this here, this Vx at the launch, this thing, because it's six times closer to this, it's going to be going slower by a factor of six. So the velocity here of this thing is going to be Vx over six. Um, you can get that from these relationships. Um, I hope that's not too puzzling or mysterious to you. I doubt that it is. Um, so uh, anyway, if this here, if this is six times further out, then it's going to be going six times faster because V is equal to omega R. They have the same omega. The whole thing has the same angular velocity. So you just have to multiply by the different R's. If you multiply by one that's six times bigger, you're going to get something that's six times bigger. Um, all right. So in part three, uh, we need to set up if we want to know the velocity of the projectile as it leaves the cup, we need to do the whole energy situation. So I've got the UG at the start. Like that's in like figure one. That's what I found here. That's going to be equal to, there is a change. I mean, things are not the same places, uh, same heights that they were at. So there's this new gravitational potential energy. And then I have to add the kinetic energy of the projectile plus the kinetic energy of the bucket. Um, or 
if you want, you could call that, you could call it that if you wanted to. You could say also kinetic energy of M, the big counterweight. All right, so um, let's get all this sorted out. So I got 30G plus 3MG. That's my answer from part two for this. And then what about after? Let's see. Um, the Where's my 10 kilograms? So I've got my 10 kilograms times G times relative to the ground, that is now uh, 15 feet up, right? Relative to the ground, yep, that's 15 feet up. Ah, uh, 15 feet, <laughs> just kidding. That's a physics joke, 15 meters, I meant to say. Um, and then what about the counterweight? The counterweight now is I think one meter up above the ground because it was three meters up, and now uh, this is two, so when it swings down, it's gonna be one meter up. All right, oops, there we go. So uh, that's M G times its new height, which is just one. And then I've got one half uh, times M of the projectile, which is 10, times Vx squared plus one half big M times uh, Vx over six squared. All right, so that's a big mess. Um, and they, I guess we're supposed to solve it for Vx. So um, I guess I better do some simplification like, uh, let's see what we can do here. So um, this is 3mg minus an mg. So I got two big M is G. And then here I've got 30g minus 150g. I got that. So that takes care of these four terms. And then on this side, I've got, let's see, five VX squared. And then I've got one, I've got M over 72 VX squared. So I've got five plus M over six squared is 36 times two, 72. M over 72. Vx squared. So I guess Vx is equal to the square root of this over this. All right. That's an ugly looking expression. Um, and then where are we at now? So that's what we did, that was part three. I got it numbered correctly. And then in C1, complete the theor theoretical model by writing the relationship for X as a function of mass. This is C for one. Uh, so since Vx, so we got x is equal to Vx times t, just in case you didn't know that, they told us. Um, but of course, we know that because the horizontal velocity is constant. And now I've got um, x is equal to uh, that expression, 2 m g minus 120 g plus m over 72 times 1.75. So something like that. And uh, that what? why does this complete the theoretical model? What's that all about? Well, what we have now is we have x as a function of m. And the data here 
that's the relationship here. We think that X depends on how much mass you put in the bucket. And that's what we were looking at a graph, at a graph of at the beginning. So uh, this completes that theoretical model. And now compare the experimental and theoretical, theoretical values of X for a counterweight bucket of mass, uh, 300 kilograms. So 300 kilograms, um, they got 37. The experimental is 37 meters, and the uh, theoretical, according to our model here, is whatever you get when you plug in 300 into this mess up here. So let me just jam that into my calculator here. I've got the square root uh, parentheses on the top. I've got two times m, that's 600 g, 600 times 9.8 minus 120 times 9.8, close parentheses, over, open parentheses, my ma uh, 5 plus 300 over 72, um, close, <clears throat> let's see, and then I got to close the whole square root and multiply by 1.75, cross my fingers, and I got about 30, uh, 39.6. So it's pretty close. Um, but the experimental one was less. Why would that be the case? Um, probably because the um, the catapult arm is not of negligible mass negligible mass um, and, or you could also say um, that there's friction at the, uh, the catapult axis, axle, whatever you, you want to call that thing. Um, so those are both uh, good explanations for why we would get a smaller um, experimental value than theoretical. Um, all right, that's a fun problem.